Welcome to another lively edition of The Deadly Experiment, ladies and gentlemen. Rick Adams, your host and producer. And uh, you'll have to uh, understand uh, the uh, background scene here is not the normal scene that you would uh, see when you watch The Deadly Experiment. But, uh, you know, given the circumstances of this phony selection that we call an election, I had to record this program uh, from my bunker. <laughs> All right, you can stop chuckling. Folks, this is The Deadly Experiment, and we are at the time right now, the time of the week of and following the national, local, statewide selections, as I call them. I purposefully do not call them elections because we have not elected. We have not elected people to administrate for us constitutionally for over, well over about 107, uh, I'd say 150 years now. Certainly past the war between the states. In the 1870s, America became a federal corporation. That was the beginning of the end of our freedom, our sovereignty, and our individual course of action. In the nation that was supposed to provide a constitutional contract for the government to protect the people as individuals and as society from the power of government. And yet we abandoned that long ago. That's what the war between the states was all about. Others call it the war of northern aggression. And that's exactly what it was because it was not fought over slavery, my friends. The war between the states was fought for economic reasons as all wars are fought for and obviously for geopolitical reasons as well vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North versus the South. Now, we don't have to get into a history of the war. To understand what followed the war was in fact the end of national sovereignty. Many of you recall if you've seen the great film Birth of a Nation, if you've seen that film regardless of the stereotypes and the controversy concerning the Negro elements of it, the message was pretty clear, and that was the end of sovereignty for the states was consummated by that war. Not only was that a major watershed, but what would follow, of course, in the 1920s, and particularly with the selection of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in 1933, that would be the consummation of the end for American freedom and independence. We will, of course, expose that as time goes on. But let me start out, folks, going back in my own lifetime. Let me just give you a sample of what I have experienced. As a young man, of course, I was eager to vote, registered to vote, and then said I would go out and do my constitutional duty. I would vote for the individual who would be the best qualified to render constitutional administrative government, whether in Washington, District of Criminals, D.C., or here in Rhode Island. I'd vote against issues, bond issues, revenue you know, issues, and other issues. And if there was one or two that was worthy of my support, why, well, I would vote for them. But very little and very few. Well, I soon found out when I was in my 20s that it was a sham. The entire so-called democratic process was a sham in America. I recall the days of George Wallace. Now... That may hearken some horrible and frightening images to you out there about racism and so forth. But forget all of that. A larger issue is far more important to understand. It wasn't about race. George Wallace was running for president, and he was running for president in 1972, when Nixon had been installed in the White House. And Richard Nixon was going to be running for re-election, if you recall. Well, folks, the third party movement was beginning to emerge from 1968, the Johnson years, to 
Richard Nixon when he was elected. So what was going to happen to Richard Nixon vis-a-vis -vis George Wallace? Well, George Wallace was the threat, not George McGovern. And what happened was George Wallace got or received four bullets in uh, Laurel, Maryland, by a man they said was Arthur Bremer. He was the, quote, lone gunman, just as we heard about Lee Harvey Oswald in the 63 assassination of JFK. Well, be that as it may, George Wallace was beginning to win primaries. He was beginning to emerge as a very serious threat, not only to Richard Nixon, who was a puppet, but to the Annenberg and other powerful elite families in this nation on the eastern coast, the Meyer Lansky crime families and so forth, to pose a serious threat because George Wallace was all about restoring state sovereignty then. He was all about get the federal government out of our lives and off of our backs. And that was no, no, no for the globalist, internationalist, Talmudic Zionists who were running the system even then. Couldn't do it. I remember that quite vividly. I remember the assassination attempt on George Wallace. I remember finding out more about Mr. Bremer and his ties ultimately to the CIA. Well, folks, what followed was the disgrace of Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon didn't know what hit him. It was a train track. It was a train. And it came down that track too fast. Nixon had to go. Richard Nixon was watergated. He was brought down by something relatively minor when you think of the things that have happened since then in the White House. And yet, Richard Nixon offended the elite. And the whole administration, virtually the entire cabinet of Richard Nixon, was selected by Mr. Annenberg, Moses Annenberg, the father, and Walter Annenberg, the son. They had an incredible influence over the Nixon administration. Well, we had to get Nixon out. And then we had to bring in Ford and Rockefeller and, of course, Jimmy Carter, an honest face. Now, all of a sudden, folks, it was time to bring about the Democrat Party in the White House for honesty and integrity. And who better than an obscure little innocent-looking peanut farmer from Georgia. Well, Jimmy Carter was relatively unknown before. Time Magazine, Look, Newsweek, the New York Times, the Washington Post, all of the Zionist media in America put his picture on the front cover and implanted the thought in your mind way ahead of time that James Earl Carter would be the man who would change America and get us back to honest Good government. Well, then Billy Carter came out of the woodwork, and Lillian, and all of them, and Jimmy Carter, of course, didn't know what hit him. Jimmy Carter, on the road to the campaign trail to the White House, said, if you see a Cyrus Vance in my administration and a Zbigniew Brzezinski when I'm elected, you will know that I have failed the American people. And lo and behold, Cyrus Vance emerged as Secretary of State, and Zbigniew Brzezinski became the National Security Advisor. Now, how did that happen? It happened because of the invisible government, the shadow government, it's called. Yes, the government which rules America and many countries of the world, except Orthodox Islamic countries now, who are resisting this new world order. All you have to do is look at the track record. Can't prove me wrong. I haven't been proven wrong yet. Quite the contrary. Everything we've told you on this program going back seven years has happened lockstep. And what's going to come is even too frightening for many of you to observe or hear. But you'll hear it if you listen and if you want the truth. So we went through the Jimmy Carter administration, and poor Jimmy Carter didn't know what hit him. The Iran crisis was planned. Again, Israel created the Iran crisis. Because the Shah of Iran was an Israeli. Well, he was not an Israeli. He was actually a Russian Jew. That's a fact. We know that. Mossadegh was the legitimate ruler of Iran until 1953, when the CIA under Eisenhower overthrew him. 
put him in exile, and brought in Shah Pahlavi from Russian Jewish heritage. They installed him. The Islamic Revolution took place, and of course, then Israel used that to create a year, years of years of years of war between Iran and Iraq. Iran never attacking Iraq, never initiating a war in almost 300 years. So. That helped bring down the Carter administration during the 80s, during the 1970s, before the Reagan so-called revolution. And what also brought him down? Do you remember? The economy. Interest rates were sky high. So it was time to get rid of poor Jimmy Carter. And then we found Ronald Reagan attracting to him as Vice President Bush. You remember the elder Bush. And, of course, Reagan was, was the little puppet on the strings, sleeping through much of his administration, because he never made a decision in his life, certainly not in his political life. He was escorted, he was, uh, shall we say, uh, taken by the arm, and put into positions of power such as the governorship of California. Well, again, folks, we had eight years of the Reagan-Bush administration. And on and on it goes, from him to Papa Bush and then to Clinton. And guess what? All this time, Americans were voting for the lesser of the evils, weren't they? Let's choose Tweedledee over Tweedledum, or Tweedledum over Tweedledee. And the same results happened. America, more internationally involved in war and terror, all because of the Israeli lobby. Clearly, the handwriting was on the wall. And yet, the economy itself was continuing to experience inflation, which is price inflation, but devaluation of the dollar. The dollar was taken off the gold standard many years ago under the Roosevelt administration, and further under Johnson and Nixon when the gold window was closed. So America was destined to experience economic destruction from within and international pariah status overseas. Now I'd like to read to you, if you don't mind bearing with my poor vision here, from the Dan Smoot report going back to the 1960s. And he was a constitutional scholar, former FBI agent, who began his own ministry of truth from Dallas, Texas, to awaken, awaken the American public to what was happening to their nation. And he was uh, quite a guy, and uh, this report had actually three separate sections to it on his television broadcast. The Electoral College, part one, two, and three. I would just like to read to you a little bit of what he says concerning the Electoral College and uh, then how we got into this mess internationally in the Middle East. He says, it is doubtful that a president of the United States has been legally elected during the past 134 years. This was in the 1960s, mind you. It is historically factual that of the 36 men who had been presidents up till now, 14, more than one-third were minority presidents. That is, they were not supported by the majority of the people who thought they were voting for a president. Now comes the question of the Electoral College. And he, he talks about the Constitution giving each state as many electoral votes for president and vice president as it has senators and representatives of the U.S. Congress. And we know that. We know the state of Rhode Island has two, because we have two, we have four. But we have two senators and we have two representatives. And then he says, it is doubtful. It is doubtful that we have had a constitutional election in the United States since the days of Andrew Jackson, his second election. And that was in the 1830s. And the reasons are, without going through too much, let me just read a little bit more for you folk out there, because time is limited. Um, he says, by the time Andrew Jackson ran for his second term, 1832, he says, Political parties had become so strong and partisan feeling was so bitter 
that political parties which controlled state legislatures began usurping the legislators' duty to appoint presidential electors. You see, we should not be voting for president. That may shock some of you. Shocked a man one day recently that I spoke to. Isn't that what democracy is all about? I said, yeah. But we're not supposed to be a democracy. We're supposed to be a constitutional republic in which we, through the electoral college system, vote for our legislature and the legislature nonpartisanly elects electors who then vote for president. And that was done not merely because of the times in which they lived and the small agricultural communities that existed and the fact that we had no uh, direct uh, way of reporting elections in those days. It was done to protect state sovereignty and American sovereignty from international influences, folks, and from uh, political corruption within. Now, we're, we're far from that point now. We're at the end of the road of the system, okay? We have no electoral college, is what Dan Smoot was saying. And so he went on to show that, that what happened was, in fact, the corruption of the political process through political parties who then would control the legislatures rather than electors. If we had honest electors, you could conceivably have a Ron Paul for president because they would vote for Ron Paul. And if the people did not like that selection, they would elect new legislatures. And the legislatures would have new electors. And that's the way it was supposed to be. All U.S. senators prior to 1913 were constitutionally appointed by state legislatures. Rhode Island appointed them, Connecticut, Massachusetts, California, New Mexico, all of the states in the Union at the time did that. But the influence of the Council on Foreign Relations types, the Rothschild cabal, and the influences of Zionism changed all of that to a democracy so that we then could corrupt the political system further. Direct election of senators has not given you more respect or response from your senators, has it? No. They're more interested in the special interest groups nationally and internationally, not about Rhode Island. You see, folks, the founding fathers and the framers weren't all that stupid. They had it pretty, pretty well figured out. Now let's move on in history, on the timeline. Smoot also says that consider, consider some examples of what has happened in the past. In 1944, when Roosevelt ran <clears throat> for a fourth term, the, con the, uh, uh, the contest between him and Dewey was close. Uh, managers of both political parties actually anticipated that the outcome would be decided by the electoral votes of four, four populous states, Illinois, Michigan, New York, and Pennsylvania. Public sentiment in those four states was as evenly divided as in the other 44. Hence, both parties concentrated on strong social special interest groups in those four key states. Now, in 1944, listen carefully now, Jews constituted the most significant special interest group in New York. At that time, Palestine was a mandated territory controlled by the British. The Zionist movement centered largely in New York City, where there were more than two million Jews at the time, was strong. Zionists wanted Palestine opened for unrestricted Jewish immigration so that Jews from all over the world could, in fact, flock there and naturally form their own nation, quote, unquote. Well, enormous dangers, as Smoot says, actually were involved here because a Jewish nation in Palestine must necessarily be carved out of the Islamic world. And he said <clears throat> then, and he was right, the Mohammedans and Jews burn with ancient animosities. 
and of course he said uh, bidding for Zionist influence in Jewish votes in New York City, both political parties in 1944 put Palestine resolutions in their platform. Now, they'd done that before. The Republican Party just did that at the convention. They want Jerusalem to be the indisputable capital of the state of Israel, which puts them right into biblical prophecy, folks, for the end times, that the bad figs would take Jerusalem, control Jerusalem, the city of the Antichrist, Matthew 24, Jesus cursing the, the bad figs, they would have that control. And now, member of the Knesset has just, uh, the Israeli Knesset has just proposed that we take Palestine and we take the West Bank and annex it. <laughs> so it fits into God's plan for Satan's children to take control of this region, ushering in the world system of the Antichrist. Just a very short few years away at the most, folks. Now, as he says, folks, he said, uh, and this is Professor Smoot speaking again, he said the result was that the 79th Congress passed a resolution calling upon Great Britain to open Palestine for unrestricted Jewish immigration. Soon thereafter, the British dumped on us the responsibility of protecting Palestine. Israel was born. Support of the socialist nation has cost American taxpayers more than a billion dollars to date in 1960s. Support of Arab refugees from Israel has also cost us many millions, and Palestine remained a loaded bomb. Whether the Zionist cause be considered good or bad, the fact is that in 1944, when we were in the third year of the most terrible war in history, worst war too, I call it, folks, the Republicans and Democrat parties gambled, gambled the security and welfare of the United States, planting the seeds of future wars by meddling in the affairs of foreign nations for the purpose of simply getting the so-called electoral votes from the Jewish population in New York City. That was the cost. Now, I'm done reading. That, folks, set the stage for where we are today. We've never been more hated than any other time. We've never been more cursed. Terrorism abounds. And yet we were told if we just went to war in World War I, all wars would cease. It was the war to end all wars. If we just granted the Federal Reserve System the power to print money, there'd be no more depression. There'd be no more recession. There would be a fine-tuned economy, the same gang that brought us the Fed, brought us into World War I, and prepared us again for yet the most diabolical, the most horrendous and horrific evil war, World War II, out of which came the whole concept of the World Bank and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Now, are we better off than we were prior to the last century? No. Are we worse off? Yes. These elections that we've just gone through prove it, folks. No matter who is sent to Washington, who is re-elected or not re-elected, the same process will continue unabated until we are destroyed. America now is in the death grips of our own destruction. And these were the seeds that were planted. Now, the seeds that Jesus referred to 2,000 years ago were the seeds that you can read about in the book of Matthew 24, among other places, including the Old Testament, including Ezekiel, including Isaiah. Folks, the bad figs would be planted, that tree, in the final generation. Read the 70th week of Daniel. Read what it says about the abomination of desolation in Jerusalem, would be the final generation final kingdom of the Antichrist system. It would be a Christ-hating, Christ-rejecting system. And the American politicians in this country have sacrificed your sons and daughters' blood, and even you young men listening and watching today. Many of you have uh, contacted me over a period of time saying you're right. 
We were wrong. We didn't know. Well, folks, it has to happen. No matter what we say or do, the end of this nation is coming. No matter how many Brendan Doherty's there are, these so-called clean guys, no matter how many little piggies there are like David Cicilline, it doesn't matter. Folks, Congress is Zionist-occupied territory. The White House is Zionist-occupied territory. And now even the courts, to some degree, including the Supreme Court, of course, staffed by political interests, is now approving of the final stages of a police state in America. Ron Paul, we voted for him in this last election, writing in his name, and I understand there are a few of you out there who voted for Rick Adams for Congress and Rick Adams for the United States Senate from Rhode Island, as well as other offices. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that, but if I were to win, folks, I wouldn't even want the seat. We are too far beyond that point of return. America, unfortunately, is in those death grips. But remember, the destiny of America and the world will give way to the end of the age when the beast system emerges from Jerusalem. And we will see the one world system controlled from that man in that temple sitting there in Jerusalem. He's called a man of sin. Who is this Antichrist? Is he Obama? Is he uh, uh, Romney? No, friends, he is Satan. The scriptures make that clear. He is Satan himself in a flesh body, come back to rule. And in Isaiah 14, we are told, when we go back and look at this, when the millennium begins and Jesus destroys Jerusalem, and there's nothing left of that Babylonian captivity to come, Jesus told us through Isaiah, what did Isaiah say? The people will hearken back and say, is that the man we worshiped? We followed him. We supported the state of Israel. We supported the man of evil. We supported Satan instead of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Will you be ready? Folks, he's going to cleanse that temple. He never cleansed the temple. He's going to cleanse the temple, and he says he's going to cleanse Judah, real Judah, and purge it. False Judah, the so-called Jews, as they call themselves, will be cast out, as he says. But he warns the real Israelites, the Adamic, Jacobite, European nations of this world, and those who are descendants of the tribes of Israel, the true tribes of Jacob, which was Israel. He tells them, lest ye be counted with the hypocrites, you will come into my kingdom during the millennium. But if you're not, you will be treated like the hypocrites. Who are the hypocrites? The hypocrites are play actors, those who say they are Israel and are not and are of the synagogue of seven in Revelation. Who are they? They're in Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem now. Mitt Romney, Obama, answer to Jerusalem, not to you. That's why we have no electoral college anymore, a real electoral college. I believe we're now at the end of today's program, and we're going to wrap things up. How many seconds do we have left out there, ladies and gentlemen? We have, what, four seconds? Okay, none. Goodbye, and we'll see you on the next broadcast.